Hey, how's it going, everybody? This is Greg Brown from Foundry, and today we have another Canova stream. Uh, this stream, we wanted to focus on talking about some of the enhancements we've made over the past couple of weeks. Uh, Vilja Harvey, the person who is our primary developer for this, has been absolutely killing it and has a new release that's ready. And hopefully we'll get that out to a broader public release uh, early next week. I'm really hoping we'll do that for Monday. Currently, we have it in uh, kind of a limited private beta uh, if it's something that you want to take a look at, then please, by all means, hop on over into Steam in the Canova forums, and uh, I will see if a message pops up there, and if you desperately want to try out this uh, new beta early on, uh, we will definitely give you a key that allows you to do so, because I am super excited about this. Um, we have made huge numbers of improvements. So before we continue with this, we are going to actually go through the process of sculpting uh, this creature. I have been playing entirely too much Fallout 4 recently because I'm really excited about Fallout 76 coming out. And so I wanted to make my own super mutant hound or my own kind of version of a super mutant hound. And so this is the in progress version of that. And uh, probably need to do one more session with it before I'm kind of really happy with it. But I think at this point we can really do quite a bit in Canova. Um, for instance, this model has 1.7 million triangles um, in the generated mesh for it, which you can actually go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, see right down here. Hey, oh, I'm sorry. Right, there we go. 1.69, 1.7 million triangles. And it actually is only taking up 117 megabytes, um, which if you tried out any early versions of Canova, uh, you, can, you could use up gigs um, just in the file itself. So we made some humongous improvements and the way that the data is stored and the way that data is leveraged, allowing us to have much smaller file sizes, um, which of course is going to be good for the application in general as it moves forward. All right, so let me run through some of these new features. One of the big ones, this is a big, big, big deal, is we've added a new meshing algorithm. And so there are two new uh, algorithms called the enhanced surface nets and dual contouring, and the original meshing algorithm is called DF3D mesh. Uh, BF3D mesh is the slowest and uses the most memory, but it does give the best quality mesh. So we're playing around with multiple different types of, uh, of uh, meshing algorithms. And at first, we had some really great results with it. Uh, it improved performance substantially, and it also uh, allowed us to uh, you know, actually produce a higher quality mesh. But it had actual, we had missing triangles, and so one of our big um, enhancements this week was correcting that problem of triangles missing. And you're gonna see in the early stages during this webinar of the sculpt, which is this is actually gonna be a two-part webinar. We're gonna show you the first half of getting to this point uh, this week and the second half next week. You'll see that there are holes in the mesh every now and then, or just a single missing uh, triangle or maybe even what looks like a quad. Uh, but we solved that problem and uh, we've been able to actually produce much higher quality sculpts uh, much smoother sculpts, and I'll even talk to you about how I got to this level of smoothness and some of the differences between that. All right, um, so we have, uh, you know, let's see, um, the new meshing algorithms generate far fewer triangles for the same model than the, uh, the uh, older ones do. And they do produce slightly rougher looking edges, but we've been finding as we play around with it, it produces a much better sculpting experience. The brush is way more responsive and you're able to just produce forms that you uh, can rely upon better. Um, and also we have uh, some improvements to the sculpting algorithm. It's more effective at skipping empty space. Um, working on volumetric uh, um, technology is really challenging because you know, we are still using triangles. We're not rendering a truly volumetric mesh. We're not rendering, uh, in this case, the ADF structure we're rendering a mesh that represents that structure. And so there's many layers of things that have to be accounted for while you work on a volumetric sculpting application such as this. We made some really big improvements there, uh, including faster, uh, including speed improvements and using less memory. Um, we have even more memory savings and that's over one gigabyte on some models, which I spoke about in the beginning and file size reductions, again, which we uh, have made some more improvements on with the new file format version seven, uh, which, uh, in, you know, on its own, cut file sizes in half, but we also made a few improvements prior to that version seven. Um, undo and redo support um, works for layer operations now for create and remove layers. So, you know, when you press undo, it's gonna do what you expect it to do. And we have keyboard shortcuts available um, for enabling and disabling the wireframe because we feel like that's very important for people to be able to evaluate the wireframe. 
uh, to understand, you know, like, hey, what, 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 what kind of resolution am I dealing with here? You know, if you're familiar with, uh, you know, sculpting already, knowing what your mesh actually looks like is going to be very useful. Uh, we also have a new option to allow your lights to follow the camera. And I'm going to come over here to my scene. I'm going to turn the turntable off and just zip around over here. You can see right now I have a static light. If I come over here and I start moving around, I can't kind of get rid of that shadow on the bottom of the feet. And all you have to do is come over here into the new scene tab, orient your model um, according to how you want it to be lit. Turn on follow camera and now the light will actually follow the camera as you uh, move around. This also works in VR, which is extremely cool. And it's actually something that we, when discussing it before we implemented it, we were saying, ah, oh, that's gonna be annoying in VR. Turns out it's not, it's actually awesome. And so it's a nice little feature that really improves the functionality of the application. We also have a lot of uh, bug fixes. Uh, some people had trouble running um, Canova when Steam is on offline. That has been fixed. So those of you who are having that trouble, um, you can now use it. And uh, a lot of other bug fixes, it's much more stable. And so I'm pretty excited about the enhancements that we have made to date. Pretty cool. All right, so this character that I'm working on, this creature, um, you know, hey, this is, uh, this is something I'm pretty happy with at this stage in development. And it, this gives me a lot of confidence that we're going to be able to produce really high quality meshes. And, uh, you know, the sculpting experience on this was very smooth. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to share with you a time-lapse video of that, which by the way, when you're doing a time-lapse video, um, including VR, uh, this time around what I did was I attached the camera to the HMD. Uh, you don't want it to be very fast. Uh, so it's about a 300% time-lapse. And that's why we're splitting it apart into two separate videos so that um, you guys can really see what's going on and also not be completely nauseated by it, right? And so let's go ahead and set this on up over here. And, uh, yeah. So, so far, uh, Sun says it's looking really smooth. Um, he's impressed. That's pretty cool. And uh, Sean O'Connor says, nice. Thanks. Yeah. No, now, I do want to clarify, Sun. You aren't going to get this smoothness right away. This is another thing, and I should have brought this up right away, so I'm glad you mentioned it. And I, I had a feeling you were going to bring up smoothness. Um, I had a very nice talk with uh, August Davies yesterday um, about uh, about this stuff, and he's another person who really wants smooth meshes because he's very um, focused on curvilinear forms, and so it's very important. Um, I am on, of course, on a on a debug beta build, and we have these different mesh style visualizations, and one of them is smooth mesh on smooth normals, um, and that's what I'm displaying right now. And you're not going to see things quite as beautifully and cleanly and clearly here. You'll see a little bit of terracing, but your experience and performance will be way better. Um, in this new version. And one of the things we're playing around with, um, there's some shading aspects I'm not really very happy with, with the unsmooth normals thing, but we're investigating uh, where those artifacts are coming from and how we can leverage that viewing mode. Uh, Cause it also gives a few performance enhancements too. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, switch on over to the video and we'll continue on and uh, show you folks what we have in store for you. And so here we go. And hop on over to the video. All right, so um, you know, in VR, this was actually the best experience I have had in VR so far inside of Canova. Um, a lot of the new meshing stuff, you can see that missing triangle that was right there for a second um, did pop up, but that is something that has been resolved now. But my performance, my speed is absolutely wonderful. Um, at this point, and I'm finding I'm able to just get more reliable forms. Um, I really love the feel of the smooth brush inside of VR. And one of the things that we're constantly talking about is how we can improve the visualization so that you can better understand what's really going on. Um, you know, VR is awesome. It's amazing. It's incredible. Um, but it is, it's a new technology that we've got to figure out new ways around old problems. Like how do we make sure people can see this stuff? And actually something that's kind of interesting, some of you uh, might uh, be interested in playing around with, there's an application I stumbled upon in Steam called OVR Drop. And it's really wild because one of the, I was having a lot of trouble with the mixed reality recordings because I put my headset on and I start working on a sculpt and I have no idea what else is going on around me in the real world. I don't know if I'm blocking the camera and OVR Drop, what it does, it allows you to actually uh, create a, uh, a window inside of whatever VR application you're using, or as long as it ends up working in your application like it did in Canova. 
and you can have a floating window that you can stream in from your desktop and, or just stream in your whole desktop. And so if you want to, you can watch a movie while you're actually sculpting in VR. Or you could pull up a whole bunch of references and keep on switching back and forth between them. Or you could even bring in your webcam stream so you can actually see that. And so thank you for that, Ed. And uh, let me get that video back up. Skype wants to notify me of stuff when I don't need Skype notifications. That's great. All right. And so it's pretty cool. It's kind of a super meta experience where it's like you're in VR and then you can watch yourself actually um, it, it, what you look like in VR. And so it makes it a lot easier to actually manage this stuff. So something worth playing around with if you're interested in, in mixed reality recording. It'll make a, your life a whole lot easier. I was very impressed with it. And I think it's on sale right now uh, since Steam has this Steam sale. Uh, but you can see that I, I just uh, pretty quickly start blocking out my forms. And uh, what I'm doing right now is I, I've actually got a window open that you can't see. That's one of the cool things about it. So if you have references that have questionable copyright qualities to them, um, you can actually have that window in there. And then nobody else um, in your recorded stream can actually see that. And I'm taking a look at various types of dog anatomy. Now, this is the type of thing that on desktop would take me a lot of time, especially um, with volumetric sculpting. Uh, because I'd have to go ahead and orient the model in such a way that I could kind of extrude forms towards me and build out the, you know, the upper leg, the thigh area, um, and then look at it from multiple different angles. And in VR, blocking out these forms is an excellent experience um, because I'm really able to sense the depth of the, uh, the model as I'm working with it. And making this like, you know, double hinged leg is, uh, is made a whole lot easier this way. Now, I only spent um, about 40 minutes in VR on this one. I spent the vast majority of my time um, in the desktop side of things. And in total, I think I spent uh, about six hours or so. Um, but, you know, being able to get these forms really roughed out quickly and easily in VR was very, very satisfying. It's super cool how you started. And it was almost like a flat, almost like the, the central kind of uh, line of the... Um of like the torso uh, and the chest. And you almost did the same thing with the thigh before building up volume uh, to kind of give it, give it thickness. Yeah, yeah, it, well, that's the thing. You know, this has a lot, of, a lot of potential, I think, for, you know, quick concepting. Like, uh, you know, some of the folks at GadgetBot um, who are, are Moto users, they uh, uh, last year were putting up a lot of interesting videos of them doing um, uh, gravity sketch, concept sketching in there. And this technology has a lot of potential for sketching. I mean, you know, the first thing we used it in was mischief, or where it came from was mischief for sketching. And, uh, and so one of the things you can't see, because um, I have it displayed in VR, but not on the desktop, which is being captured, is you could turn on display of the, of, of the actual um, mirror axis. And so I'm just, I was just sketching along that mirror plane that I could see. And, you know, I, I do think that is one of the better ways to, to start roughing things out in VR is just sketch a, a profile outline and then, you know, come at, you know, a three quarter or a front view and then start defining your outer boundaries of where you want to go. And uh, I think that is pretty, pretty freaking cool. But um, the responsiveness at this point has gotten so good, um, especially with this new meshing algorithm. And by the way, the video right now, as you see it, does not use the unsmooth normals thing I told you about before, which you know produced a much smoother mesh. This is the, the typical um, type of smoothing that we have applied. And it's kind of interesting the, the way that um, the mesh is generated uh, using that terminology. It's something that we've talked about changing. And before we introduce you guys to more of it um, or more of that stuff, we're gonna have to change the naming because it's, it's not actually smoothing, it's kind of wild. It's more like we have, they're like three dimensional filters that are applied to the surface um, that actually produce, you know, smoothing, um, averaging, and also uh, sharpness. And the sharpness actually deforms the mesh. And so we're, we're, we're actually learning quite a bit about how we can manipulate um, volumetric forms in a way that feel, that, well, it feels like it should. It feels like it's deforming the way you would expect it to. And so the experience is in improving uh, consistently, it seems, week by week. And so I'm pretty excited about where we're going. And uh, now with some of the, these enhancements, we're talking about some other very cool things that are coming. But yeah, you can see how with this video right now, it's like watching it um, with you guys, it's 
like I, there's no way I could have made this more than a 300% time lapse. I was talking to Ed like an hour ago, like, hey, do you think we should make this two streams or one? And uh, got back to me and you know was asking some questions. But like, now we're just yeah we're just doing two because imagine this is six hundred percent when this is at three hundred, uh, especially in VR. It's incredible how much your head moves. You know, it's uh, you just don't even notice it. And VR always seems for me to always articulate how freaking shaky I am, which sucks. But uh, it's it's amazing. You don't notice. You know how frequently you're moving day to day it just becomes part of the experience and when you see it played back in this way it's crazy i think this is the perfect speed i mean everything that you're doing is uh, pretty legible it's uh, easy to follow exactly yeah. and one of the things i want to do in one of the future streams is on this one i just did the vr thing in the beginning and then i just ended up focusing on the desktop for the rest of it and one of the future streams after this uh this hound is is done um is do more bouncing back and forth because uh, there are a lot of muscular forms that really could have benefited um, from using the VR mode because it is really great at kind of developing forms like you see me doing right there. Um, you really start quickly getting accustomed to the idea of placing the brush inside the model, letting it rise right above. And there's something really nice about that once you grasp that and get accustomed to it. Um, because it's uh, it's persistent. I mean, you know, uh, you're not just deforming based on some height. Um, you're actually uh, you're you're manipulating based on space, which is something that we are all very familiar with day by day. But yes, I love the smooth. It's incredible, especially in the VR side of things. So, Ed, what have you been up to recently outside of the 3D world? Because I know that, you know, that's, 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 that is your life these days here at Foundry is spending a lot of time on Moto, and 12.1 uh, is kicking butt. There's an outside? There's an outside of 3D? Yeah. I just discovered it about two years ago. It's blowing my mind still. <laughs> Honestly, it's sad, uh, but lately, there for me, there hasn't really been much, much like extracurricular, extracurricular stuff. It's all been uh, pretty much moto. Really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, it's. Uh, I almost, I almost broke down. There's been some, uh, you know, uh, watching people play Fortnite, and I'm like, gosh, should I just, should I just, no, should I just buy it? Fortnite. You should never. I know. You should never. I know. Fortnite. I'm, I'm resisting. I'm because I know it'll just. It'll just be a disaster for me. I'll just... Well, I actually, I tried. I did try to, and uh, I, I forgot who, who was, was it. Warren Marshall brought it up. I think he brought up Fortnite, and I was like, oh, okay, so somebody else who isn't like 12 is playing it, so maybe I'll give it a shot. And, uh, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a humiliating experience. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden there's these people building these giant towers all around you, and you're like, what are they, how are they doing that? I don't want to learn how to do that. And, uh, and then you hear about all these stories about, um, kids taking down networks in their high schools oh, yeah. because uh, so many people are playing it. It's like I thought I thought we were collecting kids' phones at school. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But I mean, it just it looks it looks like so much fun, and you know, I love the style. But uh, yeah, all, basically, all of my free time is just uh, it, if I'm not working, I'm just still just using Moto just for personal stuff. Just you know, right. just trying to create art. Yeah, that's the way to do it, man. It is, but you got to get out and have a good time. Sure. Oh yeah, for Is sure. Anything, uh, for, oh, it's okay. So you also you see right now. Um, this is something important to understand about working in VR with the volumetric meshes, um, because uh, say you have a limb coming off of a torso, similarly to here. Um, the of course you're always joining a portion of the mesh, um, one portion to another, and when you smooth, um, it kind of blends those together more. And so oftentimes you need to carve out a space, smooth that out, and build that negative space between a limb and a torso. And so, you know, pushing in a sharp crease isn't going to quite result um, in the look that you want. So you, I, I think you're best off just carving that whole area out and then rebuilding it. And uh, I'm pretty happy with the, the structure um, at this point that I was, I was producing. I was actually kind of surprised. It was going pretty smoothly, pretty quickly. And I was pretty happy. But you can see the couple missing triangles right there. They just disappear. It was one of these things where um, Bill is a total perfectionist. He's a brilliant, brilliant programmer. And, you know, he was saying like, oh, you know, I, I don't want to release this until I've got the triangle thing 
um, worked out and, uh, you know, Shane and I are like, no, don't worry about it. No, it just, <laughs> it's the experience is so much better. So just go for it. Uh, but then of course he solved the problem, um, before the end of this week. And so we'll see it with, with both issues, um, solved, but, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. And that's just really like a little visual thing. It's, it doesn't really affect the, uh, like the sculpting too much because it disappears when you kind of roll over it again. Right. And I mean, it doesn't matter just because anybody yeah. trying out this application, uh, from this point forward is not going to see it even, but when right. I was recording those portions, it is still there. Uh, so I do feel a need to, uh, definitely articulate that. But yeah, I wanted to make this thing a little bit different, like the, uh, than the, um, the super mutant hound in fallout four, but very similar. And I just, I just got my own, uh, super mutant hound. Her name is Gracie. She patrols <laughs> Sanctuary Hills for me, and I don't know why, but when she walks, she sounds like she's like 10,000 pounds. It's ridiculous. Like, it's, it's awesome, though. But, yeah, I've got this green mutant dog wandering around my settlement, which uh, Fallout 4 is a bad game for anybody who's a 3D artist to play because you can build settlements, and that becomes something that is very obs obsessive very quickly. <laughs> All right, so I switched over to um, the desktop mode at this point. I was pretty happy with the forms that, you know, blocked out. And at this point, I just want to start, you know, going through and refining these forms on the, on the desktop side of things. And uh, I think I probably was pulling up a whole bunch of references at this point. And there we go. Ready to continue on with this process. And I'm playing around quite a bit right now with, brush strength and I'm also even playing around with um, the INI file, the preferences INI file behind the scenes um, because you can actually change the LUT which the LUT controls the range of strength or the um, the actual range for the radius and so you can actually modify how Canova behaves quite a bit in that file and so playing around a lot with okay what gives me exactly the feel that I want and I'm still not there yet as far as like, okay, um, you know, this is exactly how I want it to feel, but it's getting so, so, so close. And so unfortunately, um, you're going you're gonna to see me working with very soft brushes quite a lot, which I irritatingly do so um, in other applications as well. But um, on this model, I was no, it, it was almost frustrating to me how often I was doing it because I was having to tell myself, like, no, you just need to lighten up on that just a little bit. So there we go, pulling up a... A reference which showed up there for a second uh, got a uh, a 21 by 9 monitor uh, I guess about two years ago and it's absolutely wonderful you know the wide ultra widescreen monitors because you can have your application open um, at the scale it would use or the proportions it would usually be on a 16 by 9 monitor but then still have like 30 percent of space left over just to throw up a whole bunch of references and uh, love the ultra widescreen monitors. Hope they take over. And Netflix just started supporting them, actually. So you can actually watch cinematic films with no borders, which that excites me. Maybe I'm just that guy. <laughs> now, Greg, um, I know that we were talking about like a method where you sculpt everything in one layer and then you, you kind of like break it apart. Like in, in this case, you might do that with uh, the limbs or the, the creature's head. Did you do that for this one? I did or? not do that at all for this one yet. Um, yeah, I may later on, you know, um, it, it, that is, I think for a biped, it's even more important. This, this, this creature, I mean, he doesn't even have a neck um, mm -hmm. really, you know, I kind of wanted to make him look like he had a fused spine and his, his head was fused to his torso, kind of just a, a tank of an animal. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, that is a workflow that is useful, especially for bipeds with long limbs and long branching limbs into fingers and stuff like that, like very, very helpful. Um, and I think as we add more features in the future that I really shouldn't talk about, that's going to become even more advantageous for other reasons. You know, like uh, we have talked a little bit about um, various types of Booleans that would be massively useful um, uh, at that point, especially if you could split it apart into multiple different layers and work on those different layers separately or independently, um, you know, improving performance, but also just letting you kind of focus on one area, but then be able to merge them back together uh, towards the end. Because interestingly, that's something that I've been doing for sculpting workflows and other applications, uh, not the whole splitting apart thing, but working in segments. Um, I actually got a, a Moto uh, assembly that was supposed to be a character creation kit. 
that leverage mesh fusion that I need to go back to that at some point and keep on working on it because I think uh, some of the stuff we added in in 12.1, some of the procedural stuff would make it more possible. Wait a minute, Greg. This is the first I'm hearing of that. You uh, is this an assembly that you're working on that you created? I worked on a long time ago, like well, like two years ago, and I haven't ah. touched since. But yeah, it, well, I mean, you know, such like just like the VR portion of, of this here, right? Proportioning is such an important aspect, um, and uh, flexible proportioning, which you don't have with the volumetric stuff unless you work in multiple layers, um, is such an important aspect. And I think you could actually have. Um, a building proportioning workflow using Modo that uh, could basically make make something like a an extended concepting phase also the final modeling phase. Anyway, that's a that's another conversation that I should not have brought up. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe you guys will see that at some point. Um, I wanted to incorporate that idea with Canova a little bit in the future because uh, I think it would actually it would make for a completely killer workflow with uh in, in conjunction with canova definitely yeah i know uh cindy's here uh, hey cindy uh, she says um greg's mic volume seems a little bit low i i haven't noticed it um if anybody else has uh, so is is ed's mic volume not low yeah let us know in the uh, in the chat um how the audio My quality is it's a little low it's hitting the top of green and creeping into yellow for me here i can pull this up a little bit is that any better cindy You'll get back to us in 15 seconds. <laughs> yep. But yeah, it's wild experimenting with this thing because I mean, I, I do have my ingrained behaviors as far as sculpting, like what I want to do, and then you know, seeing how the mesh responds, and uh, and then kind of changing. You know, all right, should I try this approach? Should I try this strength? What's the result of that? Does this give me what I want? Should I smooth now or should I just stay blocky? Um, but also right now um, at this stage, I still am not in this unsmooth normals uh, you know, thing that I, I showed you guys in the very beginning that you know helped me get this super, super clean, smooth mesh. Um, so anyway, there is, uh, um, this is still, uh, um, still at a point where I find aspects of it you know, kind of a little bit frustrating, but the experience is really, really good at this point. And by the way, at SIGGRAPH this year, um, we're having a pretty awesome Moto event. Um, don't want to necessarily announce the lineup because I don't know if we've really announced the lineup yet, um, but definitely tune in for that. Um, if you're at SIGGRAPH, definitely stop by and check that out. And we'll also be talking about Canova, and I'm hoping we'll be able to show you guys some super cool stuff at that point um, regarding Canova. Yeah, definitely looking forward to that. Can't wait to uh, can't wait to hopefully hopefully uh, meet some of you guys there. That'll be fun. Oh, so you're gonna be there, Ed? Oh yeah, yeah. Awesome. I just uh, just got news that I'll be I'll be going. That's great. So that's fun. Uh, yeah, Sun asked. Really uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Greg. Go no, ahead. Please, no, no, no. The, 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 what are you saying? I was just gonna mention um, about uh, Sun said volumetric rigging and posing would make this much easier in the future. I think he was referring to uh, just. Uh, you know, separating the limbs out and, uh, you know, I guess just posing. There's, you know, yeah, I mean, the way it's set up right now, um, you know, you can parent items to each other. And, uh, and so, yeah, there's, there, I, 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 I'm pretty sure that if, if you were playing around with it, uh, Sun, you would definitely immediately see the direction that's going. Um, it is something that we kind of were accounting for now deformation with rigging, you know, uh, that's goes into another realm of scary, scary technology. Uh, but yeah, if you were splitting apart a mesh into multiple separate individual elements, but then able to transform an entire leg from, you know, the actual hip um, and uh, have everything follow along and then move down to the, you know, the knee and then, you know, just rotate that just ever so slightly. Yeah, totally, hugely helpful. And it's actually another thing that in VR is, is phenomenal, actually, because you, uh, it's so easy to transform or rotate things um, like that. So yeah, it's one of the things that we're thinking about. Um, it's very hot on our minds. Um, this technology has a lot of potential, and right now we're trying to, you know, make this as solid of a sculpting experience as possible. Which, by the way, is such a hard thing to uh, focus on, just because there's so many other cool things that we can and want to do with it. Um, but we're trying to be responsible about this and really say like, no, 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 let's 
let's get the sculpting experience, the sculpting feel, the performance up there. And then we'll have, you know, a base on which that we can expand is something that is really practical and really useful. Yeah, you know what this guy started starting to remind me of? Uh, was it Ghostbusters 2 with the two yeah, gargoyle Gozer, dogs? Yeah, Go Oh, okay. Was it Goz Gozer? Was Gozer one of them? Or, yeah, I, I think, think yeah. So. That sounds, sounds like it was probably Gozer. It sounds right. Yeah, I haven't, I don't, okay. That's something else I've got to watch again. It's yeah, been a while. Star, yeah. Yeah, yeah, go, yeah. I've been watching a lot of bad old movies lately, <laughs> actually. It's incredibly satisfying, actually. Media is too easily accessible these days. I always dreamed of this time, you know, like where it's like everything is at your fingertips and mostly accessible. And then it's like, I, I just can't believe how hard it is to find something you want to watch. It's like what this week on Netflix, like Glow came out, which by the way, if you haven't watched Glow, watch it. It's freaking awesome. Um, that's the pro wrestling. Yeah. One? It's yeah, the female. female pro yeah. I remember like, I remember seeing that on like Sunday, like, Sunday mornings at like 1130. It was like one of those shows they put on on like at like church time because nobody would be watching TV. And uh, it was awful. It was terrible, you know, but this is a dramatization of of them creating that show. And it's it's hilarious. Uh, and then, of course, the new Luke Cage, I think, came out just during the past week. All oh, right. Yeah, I think um, I think Greg, I think that's Greg from Pixel Fondue says uh, the, the dogs were the terror dogs. Yeah, the goes are the Gozarian was the uh was the demon uh, ah all right uh, and then <laughs> and uh, that was ghostbusters one it wasn't it wasn't ghostbusters two that's right you know you know greg the next greg. time you next time you bring up something along those lines and a correction just please first start off with actually yeah now because I, I just i just think that's the right way to start that off <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's impossible to miss that that uh, uh that connection i mean it's, it's a big beefy dog creature that sort of is based on pitbull anatomy kind of ish yeah and then sun just says uh yeah it's great to focus on the foundation uh first which well, is yeah, yeah it's key. sure it's it's just i mean it's what we you know it's what we got to do to actually make something that people you know can use and will want to use and, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think this has a lot of potential um, as a sculpting application, but we've got to uh, develop it into something that you, you guys really feel like you want to use, you know, and so I think we're making great progress in that respect. And more props to Vil on that. I think Vil has learned far more about sculpting than he ever actually wanted to. Yeah, Vil actually, uh, having no like uh, sculpting experience, he sculpted a, a head uh, and posted yeah. it. It was pretty pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh. And I would I would say that was above your well well above your typical developer art. Yeah. And Lukash was working on this with us for a while. And Lukash, uh, I remember he's asked me to do models for him before um, for ACS kit and stuff like that. And he's always very self deprecating uh, about like, oh, I can't model anything. Can you can you be one of your characters and. Uh, and it's like when he worked on this, we all found out that that wasn't true. <laughs> yeah. you know, he's actually a pretty talented sculptor, but he cuts himself down all the time when he talks about it. He's really quite good. Yeah, L Lucas is, is actually an unbelievable sculptor. I don't know what yeah. – <laughs> it's funny. I don't know what he's talking about. He's, uh, his stuff is, is pretty inspiring actually. Yeah, well, he, he just started studying, you know, which is kind of interesting. He just took a very academic approach to it, and he was very quickly making some nice stuff. And like some of the stuff he made in Canova, he did without a smooth brush at all. It's all really kind of chunky, blocky stuff that was attractive, chunky, blocky. It was like you could, it was like you could really see the the brush strokes in it, you know. And it looked almost like some of the like impressionistic sculpture from Rodin, and uh, it's really quite good. I'm sorry, I keep on making guys look at this this um, uh, super mutant hound butt, but it's uh, <laughs> one of the terrible aspects of uh, of trying to sculpt things is you kind of look at everything. Uh, Sean says that uh, your, your volume may be fading a little bit, Greg. Um, Is it I, really? I was, I was told that I was a little bit um, too loud. So, uh, guys, just keep us updated in the chat to let us know. Uh, there we go. Okay, so I just brought Ed down, and I'm bringing myself way up. And so hopefully, yeah, I'm trying not to hit the red, but that should be balanced relatively well. 
as long as I don't end up stepping on this uh, cord that toggles the microphone. No, I've gotten so, it. Hmm? I was just going to say, um, so your reference, I'm assuming that you, you picked like uh, like bulldog reference, like very stocky, stocky type of dog. Lots of pit bulls. Um, I, I, you know, I also, of course, looked at um, a lot of references uh, for the, the Super Mutant Hound from, uh, from Fallout 4. I even extracted a model from Fallout 4 because you have this thing called NIFScope that allows you to extract files from Fallout 4. So you can actually look at the model, which is really helpful. Oh, very um, cool. Yeah, no, it's awesome. And uh, you know, go ahead and assign your 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 textures, and you can take a look at it shaded in Modo, um, which I mean, really wish uh, that was more common than it is. I mean, looking at true three D reference, but yeah, lots of lots of pit bulls, um, some Rottweilers, stuff like that, very muscular animals, and then also just uh, and like just uh, dog anatomy, things of that sort. Um, I find even when I'm I'm doing something that. I'm, I'm trying to really, truly create a finished model. What I like to do is I like to build things out structurally. And I mean, the human body is mechanical, you know, it's, it's actually, it's the human body is a giant suspension bridge, really, a really crazy messed up suspension bridge, and especially your lower back, which is almost literally a suspension bridge. Um, but I like to build things out structurally, even if you have a character that isn't necessarily very muscular, you build out their musculature first, and then you go in on top and uh, and start blending and smoothing that, basically simulating adding the layers of fat and the distribution of fat. And uh, if you do it well, where you use broad strokes, which I don't really always do here, um, you can even get some of the muscle striations that would you know possibly appear through um, the skin to show up. And so it's a it's a very um, I think a practical way of working and something else I've been playing around with in Canova is doing this muscular sculpt and then having another layer on top of that where I go in and actually start laying the skin on top of that in a second separate layer. And uh, I think it's, a, it's something that has a lot of potential workflow wise, but currently is a bit of a challenge. Yeah, that's cool. Just because it's almost like working on an ecorche kind of. Yep, uh, that's exactly it. Figure. I mean, there's a reason why those always look so good. <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, it would be pretty. It wouldn't even be all that crazy to talk about. And this is not a feature, but you know, even using those. Well, I think at one point they used eraser nubs, and they don't necessarily need anymore. But you know, defining the thickness across different areas of of, of a surface. You know, like how how thick would the uh, um, the, the cellulite and the skin actually be in this area? versus the muscle that's going to appear underneath it. So wait, how would they use eraser nubs? Like, uh, how would, I don't get the connection. Like, uh, Oh, uh, to define height off of a surface. Oh, okay. Oh, so almost like those little pegs that you see, like when they do forensic reconstruction. Yep. Of, uh, okay. Got it. Yep, exactly. And cool. so, because I mean, you know, very underneath the eye, that's going to be pretty shallow, you know, really, um, for the most part, but, uh, around the midsection, it's probably gonna be pretty thick. You know, um, but you, you use that as guides over the surface for, you know, what is, what is the thickness of flesh in these various areas? Uh, it looks like Sean says that I, uh, I've gotten a little bit low again. Um, okay. Well, we think, will get this yeah, on up. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's more important that your, uh, your volume is, uh, no, it's not. You're talking. Above. Oh yeah. You're, you're, you're just too nice. Ed. Uh. Don't worry. If you meet Edit Sigraph, we'll make sure that he's worked so hard that he's super mean. <laughs> I don't think it's possible, but yeah. anyway. I think we've got a pretty good Sigraph coming up this year, though. The lineup that I've been hearing so far that I will not share because I really don't know how much Jen, who has been working on it so hard, because Jen's amazing. Yeah, Jen. Jen Goldfinch, you're incredible. Oh, yeah. Jen's great. Yeah. yeah um, I don't want to blow up her spot, but she's put together an incredible Sigraph this year. Um, if you guys aren't there, uh, you should definitely tune in to some of the live stuff we do. Uh, it's going to be worth your while um, just for the just for geeking out, general geeking out, because there's some pretty cool presentations that are going to be happening. Yeah, and if you uh, follow us on our our Foundry page, uh, Foundry Moto is the name of our uh, Moto uh, centric page. I'll definitely be doing some Facebook live streaming just for little. Little things to show you guys, like what's going on at SIGGRAPH. Cool. Very, very cool. Now, Greg, I noticed some like some long kind of striations, kind of um, like some concave striations. Are they just kind of like 
demarcations to let you know like where you're going to like right along the the sternum there of the uh of the chest uh, oh you mean right down the center that i was doing exactly i was just yeah. separating the pectorals i mean if you notice like on 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 you know a, a short hair like dog like something like a pit bull that's really beefy they have pecs you know yeah, yeah. Um, they look more like a chicken breast um you know as far as the the shape and form but yeah they're pecs and uh and so yeah just starting to try and define you know the the superficial musculature um that will help make this look a little bit better and see like this is one of these areas where especially looking at it after the fact and even as i was working on it i was thinking like you know this is one of those areas where throwing on the headset really quickly and kind of refining these voluminous forms that make up the uh make up muscul musculature uh would be very helpful like i had a um, a sculpture teacher that and I disagree with her on this. It, she's right from an educational standpoint because it sets the right mindset, but it's not always true. Um, but it, it is largely true is there is no such thing as concave forms on the human body. That's, I've heard that too. That's I've heard not, that too. That's not actually true. I, don't, I disagree with it. You can produce concave forms on, on the human body, but what it means is you have a whole lot of connected convex forms. And so your concave forms um, are a result of connected convex forms. And so it's one of these things that, like, in my opinion, like, when I heard her say that, I, 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 like, I kind of got into a little debate about it with her, which was, did not help me. Um, but, uh, you know, then she had to re-clarify again. It's, it's a good principle to consider, you know, um, because it does make you look at musculature as voluminous. And, like, I remember, like, I've gone into a lot of um, classes that, you know, that teach sculpture that – you look at the student's artwork and it's oftentimes very orthographic looking, you know, where uh, if that doesn't make sense to you, it's looking at things without any sort of perspective distortion from front, left and top or bottom or whatever. And you can see the rigidity of these orthographic views because people have trouble working in perspective a lot of times. Um, but then also the musculature was like you see right now where I'm just cutting in a line and a lot of times people will just cut in a definition line and they don't build up the volume of the musculature. And even if that isn't there on your actual, you know, real world reference, or say you're, you're creating something that truly um, is, is a real object, you're better off building up that volume and then reducing it. Because even if um, that volume is very subtle, uh, it's there, you know, there are these, the there's definition between the different muscle groups. And so it's a good, it's a good thing to think about um as far as what you're doing with organic sculpture um thinking about everything being convex but you can remind yourself it's not necessarily true it's just so funny i, I th that you're only the second person who ever brought that up but uh the, the first person was a sculpting instructor that i had and uh I, I to me it was always a little bit strange too like i understand it but it just feels like there there are certain points that are you know concave I know that they are just the kind of the meeting points of the convex areas, but you know. Yeah, I, I just think it, it helps you think about it. Like if, if you look at a lot of the really great kind of stylized anatomy that's out there that you can learn from, it's highly convex, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, if you if you look at you know anatomy with uh, with um, basically all all the cellulite and the skin stripped off, it's almost totally convex. You know, like. Uh, it's, it's one of these things that it's, it's, a, it's a partial truth. It's like, it's like telling kids in second grade, there's no zero or zero is not an, or zero is like not a number, you know, like, and then telling them, you know, a couple of years later, no, well, this actually it is, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's just something to try and get you thinking the right way about it, I suppose. So, uh, I know that, uh, Lukash was focusing on Bern Hogarth, um, as mm -hmm. a, uh, kind of, he was, he was studying some Bern Hogarth anatomy. Is there any, uh, like uh, anatomical teachers that you, um, that you like kind of, uh, find extremely useful for sculpting specifically off the top of my head. I went, I mean, Bern Hogarth, Hard, uh, Bern Hogarth is great. Um, a specific anatomy artist. No, I would, I mean, an Atlas of anatomy for artists is phenomenal. That's the one that I, I like absolutely lived on when I was in high school, went mm -hmm. to a, uh, um, a little, private art school thing after school for a couple of years in high school. And, uh, that's what they had you work from. Um, what's the, is it Berlusconi the guy who did all those etchings? Um, was that, uh, it? I think so. It was like, was, these... Brunelleschi did like the net. He has like the, uh, but I don't know if he, I don't know if he did the etchings. Yeah. I sure. have to see. 
I really paid much uh, attention to the names, but I, you know, the Ber- Berlusconi. But uh, yeah, I keep on kind of forgetting. I'm not actually making anything right now. I can actually look stuff up on my phone. <laughs> I know. Um, like I was just thinking, like George Bridgman's book. I always had his up there next to uh, Bern Hogarth. Uh, George Bridgman is a one that I like. There's a guy named uh, Gottfried Bombs. I think a German. I think uh, he has a couple books on anatomy, which I really, really like. Very nice. You've been studying the sh- studying quite a bit. I was going to say something else, <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, studying quite a bit of anatomy. I know. Um, I don't mean this as a, a critique of all pit bulls because they're they're certainly uh, fearsome creatures. But uh, I think they've been skipping leg day, Greg. Well, for now, I did. I, I, I gave him some some leg love the the uh, uh, towards the end, um, and so yeah, I was working on the front quite a bit, and then at the end, I started working on the rear. There could be quite a bit more. Um, his glutes could use quite a lot more definition um, later on down the line. Uh, so if I come over here, and then I switch on over to Canova, you can see he's got much more definition um, at a later stage. Uh, still needs more more strength and more volume, but overall, quite uh, quite happy with it at this point for the, the amount of time that has been spent on it. So let me go ahead and come back over here. And run this. There we go. Oh, yeah, that looks great. Oh, that's right. I, I always forget that it takes like 10, 15 seconds for, uh, for you to see what's going on. We need to live in the same city, Ed. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah, highly Austin recommend Austin. Awesome. It is. It's wonderful. Yeah. I've been going to a place called Barton Springs quite a lot, um, which is a uh, natural spring here that they basically dammed it up and made it a three-acre swimming pool. Allegedly, Robert Redford learned how to swim in Barton Springs. And they've got a diving board there, and then it empties out into this river. And uh, like they've got all sorts of dangerous things like rope swings and <laughs> like trees that have fallen over that people are doing all sorts of crazy stuff into the river on it's lots of fun this is a great city but there we go you can see i'm still not using the unsmooth normals um uh aspect here this is still the um the new meshing with all the typical um smoothing applied and you can start to see the terracing and this is something that, as I was working on some of these areas, it ends up becoming a frustration um, where it's like you see, I just undid that stroke right there. Um, it's something where it's like, all right, you know, I really want to be able to get definition. And by turning on the unsmooth normals mode, which we'll, we'll uh, try and get something like that out to you guys once we're really happy with it, um, I was able to have a more predictable experience and get forms that I was I'm more comfortable with. I'm expecting by the time we uh, we hit SIGGRAPH, I'll start to be able to produce some things that I might really really want to go and retopo and start building to building into uh, final assets. Um, but man, the the work that um, Villa has done as far as reducing uh, file size, for instance, that is just absolutely huge because it's you know I remember actually I was looking on um, Slashdot uh, years ago. And there was some conversation about 3D, and this person chimed in who clearly knew nothing about it uh, because they were talking about how 3D data um, is basically like uh, just laying out every point in space within a certain boundary. And it's like, no, 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 no. You know, it's like as far as modeling a moto or whatever, you've got this shell. We're not, we're not, you know, defining, you know, all the points inside that at a certain resolution. That's voxels. You know, in this case, that's what you're doing. You know, you've got all this stuff inside that's being um, defined and then a shell built around that um, so the data itself is just so heavy and for for Ville to have gotten you know um, in the case of this model uh, the the mesh itself being 1.7 million polys uh, for him to get that down to 117 megabytes um, without any sort of compression like uh, like zipping the files or whatever man that's that's impressive yeah that's huge I uh Prior to prior to this update, I was making some some files that were just they were so huge it was uh, <laughs> it would take so long to load. Yeah, oh, I broke it. You know, uh, <laughs> it's at first it, it it was there was some kind of hard coded limit in there that it just wouldn't 
read a file over 2.5 gigabytes and I had to be like hey Bill what happened here and he's like oh okay yeah I'll turn that off and I'm like, <laughs> it's like I had some files that were like four gigabytes and stuff and uh, those files now um, are like down around like anywhere between like 500 to 700 megabytes um, but those are like you know meshes that ended up being about four million triangles and so um, yeah it's uh, it's uh, we've been waiting for volumetric um, uh, technology to be more practical for quite a long time. Like I remember, what was it like 1997 or 98? I was like reading an article about like uh, Quake 3. I was, loved Quake 3. And there, was all, there were all these rumors about Id's new engine that Carmack was working on. It was called like the Trinity engine. It sounded so cool. And he wanted <laughs> to pursue voxels and it never materialized, you know, and uh, it's, it's something that people have been trying to make practical for a really long time. But um, the amount of data that's, that's needed for that is just so freaking tremendous. I think we're just finally getting to a point where our systems have enough storage and bandwidth um, to be able to cope with it. Now, one thing that you haven't mentioned uh, during this uh, session is that your strength uh, of the brush is, is very low, and that's what's kind of allowing you to build up slowly, uh, yeah, methodically. M mentioned that early on, that I, I'm going oh, okay. uh, way lower than I think I even should be. I'm being a little bit too cautious. Um, and so I think I could, I could definitely um, strengthen it up a, a, a bit. And uh, towards the end, I started using um, like basically a, a strength of around anywhere between 6 and 12. Um, and I found I really enjoyed that and because the smooth with the um, using the smooth tool, the smooth brush, along with the unsmooth normals mode that you guys don't quite have access yet to, uh, yet it, it had a really good feel. The way the mesh would smooth and reduce underneath the brush was very predictable. And so I felt way more comfortable um, using a strong brush. And so, yeah, it's... Uh, it's something that can be frustrating to watch because big, strong strokes uh, are way more entertaining and they can actually be more descriptive. And I think some of the, the sculpts I'm going to be doing from this point forward will, uh, um, will start to, to show that. Man, there we go, showing, showing between the legs a lot. <laughs> I've had so many weird situations arise from stuff like that because I have so much reference material. Like in college, like people would always come into my room without knocking and it's like you hadn't you never knew what i was going to be looking at you just have to own it you just have to yeah no it. that's what you do yeah <laughs> actually had yeah, that do happen during a demo once i'd added all my references to moto's preset browser you know because i'm like well it'd be a good place to have them and uh and so i i had this demo to do and i opened up moto and uh i launched moto and the preset browser had been open when i closed it and so when I launched Moto, it just automatically opened up the preset browser in my references directory. And it was just like this list of nudity. You know? <laughs> it's like, oh, my God, it's like loading. And I couldn't do anything for like, you know, like 10, 15 seconds. And so finally, I'm like apologizing and I like shut it down. But it was a whole bunch of artists and they were just laughing. And they're like, no, no, it's OK. That's how that's, that's I've got a, I've got a folder like that here, too. But I'll tell you what, the fact that it's like a slow buildup um, using like a, like a low strength brush, uh, it kind of like helps to see in time lapse because that um, line on the that you had making like the, the lats of the mm -hmm. uh, of the creature, um, mm -hmm. it kind of like it, it popped in pretty quickly just because of the time lapse. Yeah, it, yeah, mostly. I, I, I mean, I personally would like to see that happen faster, and I think it could happen faster. And, you know, taking a look at the model, the actual uh, model, uh, um, not at the end, but in its current state. Uh, you can see that I got a lot more definition I was happy with and a lot towards the end as I was like, you know what, all right, I'm starting to really, really grasp more firmly, especially with the new meshing and stuff, how I produce the voluminous forms that I want. And uh, so ended up producing things that were smoother and tighter. And I really, in the past, wasn't using the chisel brush very much. Um, but with the new meshing, um, I, I, I find I'm using the chisel brush quite a bit now because it, it is a great way to add definition. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that I am feeling very confident about as far as uh, this becoming a very practical tool for people um, you know, in the short term. It's becoming uh, something that I, I really enjoy using. Definitely. Yeah. Now, but, Greg, it also looks like um, 
is this a special mat cap? Because it looks like there's a little bit of subsurface, or maybe like it a, is. It you know what? I'll 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 share that on the uh, um on on the Steam forums. It's it's very basic. You can actually just drop it into a folder, and then it becomes an option. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a fake subsurface scatter um, shader that is kind of based on a way of doing fake subsurface in Moto's advanced viewport uh, using gradients because gradients do work in Moto's advanced viewport. And uh, it does give you a little bit better sense of the of the structure. You can see, like right at this point, I'm 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 building up like lots of um, nodules, I guess. You know, I have lots of bumps instead of lots of big strokes. And uh, I've, I was finding towards the end, I was loosening up quite a bit on those. And you guys will will see that portion of the sculpt uh, next week. And taking it to the point I showed in the beginning of this webinar, and I will show. Uh, again at the end of this webinar but yeah we got to make sure people can really really see what they're doing that's probably the most important thing and at this point you can also see uh, that the light is moving along with my model which uh, man that makes things so much easier to see the surfaces so much so dramatically easier to see them yeah it's such a nice feature well it's just important you know it's one of those things we we really have to provide to people to make this something you guys want to use. And there's been a lot of cool stuff coming out um, VR wise or kind of little mini announcements, right? Like uh, we saw the latest Knuckles prototype during the last week. Oh yeah. Yeah. Which it, looks super promising. They didn't, um, they didn't reveal like a timeline, did they? No, I, it, it just sounded like it was soon again. I'm sure we'll hear, but apparently they're, uh, they're expanding their release to more developers, and so it's not just a limited set. Um, but yeah, that looks extremely interesting and uh, curious uh, what what's going to be possible. Because like Steam does have a good reputation for those input devices, like the Steam controller. It's kind of um, I don't know, it's debatable as far as how good it is. I have one. I don't really use it. The trackpads were a little weird, but it's like I, I think most people had the same reaction, which was like, ah, this is a really cool idea. Needs more work, but uh, it had a lot of potential, and it seems like the Knuckles controller are kind of like the, the like an elevated VR version almost of the Steam controller, and so I, I'm pretty optimistic. Oh wait a minute, uh, Greg. When you say the Steam controller, you're not talking about the Vive controllers. You're talking no. about uh... yeah, the actual Steam uh, desktop game controller. Oh, is that the one with like the two trackpads? The two like, trackpads. Track yeah, it was, right. it was. It was. It was. I. 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 Nobody. I think the only person I know that really used it heavily was was Brandon Reddick. Brandon always was actually like playing Rocket League, and I'm like, why are you missing that ball? And he's like, well, I'm using this controller. It's like, why? Are you, <laughs> why are you doing that playing Rocket League? But uh, but yeah, it had. It's something that it it had an awkward feel to it. But at the same time, whenever you used it, you were like, this is really cool, though. You know, and would love to have seen a. Steam Controller 2.0, but now the Knuckles seem to be coming out, and that might go further. All right, so at this point in the sculpt, I have turned on the unsmooth shading, and so a lot of the terracing and artifacting you were seeing before is gone. Um, it is also, I believe, the um, the uh, the latest release from Ville, um, which also eliminates the missing triangles. I'm pretty sure at this point that's the case. And uh, it's, you know, almost because of the lack of terracing, it's harder to see the effect of the brush on the surface. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, it, it really is a, I mean, it's a pleasant experience when the brush runs over the surface. It does what I think it should do, um, which I think anybody with any experience jumping between many sculpting applications understands the frustration of the brush not behaving the way you expect it to. It's makes you angry it's frustrating and so uh this was a really satisfying um experience uh working with it at this point and you know he's starting to uh to beef out a little bit and uh, kind of like his overall shape it'd be fun to finish this this guy up once he's done and actually toss a rig on him in moto yeah that'd be awesome it'd be, it wouldn't take too much work to you know do a simple Mixamo rig and grab some kind of quadruped animation. I love the scapulas, how, uh, you know, quadrupedal scapulas tend to be like uh, upright. As They're to weird. Ours. They are. They're so weird. My scapulas are kind of like that. I have a, I have a mutation. It's my mutant power. I can, I can, <laughs> I can, I can uh, push my, my, uh, 
uh, my scapula's oh, out. The, yeah. The point you can point the the bottom point you can. I've seen two people yep. do that before. Yeah, it's, that's yep. crazy. It it's kinda, creepy. It is. Yeah. That's cool. You have to find some like uh, practical application. There is that. there is no practical application <laughs> at all for it. You know, it's 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 completely useless and problematic. I'm pretty sure. Actually, I've had shoulder problems most of my life. Oh yeah. Yeah, totally. But uh, yeah, it's it's definitely definitely useless drove my mother nuts anytime i did that <laughs> saw a video of a kid uh walking like a cat pushing the scapula out it was Oof. actually it was surprisingly it, like it was like oh my god that actually is incredibly convincing it's pretty cool we've all got our little mini genetic mutations it's just too bad like none of them are ever like shooting fire out of your fingertips or flying <laughs> A lot yeah, more if, fun. if only. If yeah, only. right. I remember catching spiders before I would go to the doctors, hoping they would give me an x ray and I would turn into Spider Man, but it just never. Hey, I couldn't catch a spider. Are maybe. you serious? As a, as a little kid, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was my goal. Wow. I, I hate spiders. I would definitely not have gone catching spiders. Yeah, I tried. All right, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you didn't like trying to radiate them yourself first. That would have that would even be more disturbing. It is interesting when you when you look at quadrupedal anatomy and you start to see the parallels between it. Like looking at the the stuff from Fallout Four. I mean, their 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 work is uh, like Bethesda is just so good. And uh, you you take a look at you know the the anatomy and it was pretty cool how they were doing their. Um, uh, their super mutant hound because it was it was very much a mix between dog anatomy and human anatomy, but it almost kind of accentuated how these muscle groups are repurposed and adapted for different types of anatomy. You know, there all, all that stuff is still there uh, for both quadrupeds and bipeds. You know, like I mean, a dog has glutes, like it really does. And like there's that example oh, yeah, of yeah, totally. it just popped up really quickly. Um, but it, it's really cool when you see the different ways that it connects and you see the different ways that um, it ends up being used to actually um, produce different um, uh, different forms. It's pretty wild. So are we stuck over here? I'm going to skip on ahead there. Yeah. Yes, I probably went off and got like six cups of coffee at that point. <laughs> My greatest addiction. You know, Greg, this is this could be spreading misinformation, but do quadrupeds not have clavicles? Uh, I don't know. I, I think they do. I don't see any reason why they wouldn't. It would have a different purpose, wouldn't it? But I mean, you know, they can actually lift their arms up and you need the clavicle to be able to raise your shoulders, you know? And so, and if I, I'm curious, I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll look that up. I, I don't know if it, it was one specific, uh, type of, type of creature or, uh, it'd be strange for that just to show up on, on bipeds, right? Because yeah. I mean, you could see it kind of disappearing into something that isn't very useful but let me see again i can actually look up on my phone this time that's around, uh which is that's our canova cool. weekly trivia <laughs> do, do, do quadrupeds have uh, uh clavicles of course everything yeah, wants like... to be in profile so it's actually hard and uh I do not see a clavicle listed here. So what did it become? It had to have become something or it just disappeared into nothing. That's pretty wild. I remember hearing something. That's why uh, it just popped into my head. That is uh, that is definitely pretty random, uh, random for sure. Are you thinking about that because of um, good old Andy Brown? Oh, no. Poor, poor Andy. Yeah. Uh, no, I was, I was just thinking about like uh, how different their uh, their scapulas are to ours. Uh, yeah. Or just how differently positioned they are. They are. Um, I don't think there is a clavicle. Maybe it became like an upper ring on the rib cage or something. I don't see it here at all, and I don't see it. I don't see it articulated at all. Yeah, that is pretty wild. Because I also know there's um. Like I think cats can like pronate and supinate their forearms the, the way we can, but dogs mm -hmm. can't. Like they can't like yeah, completely the way we locked. Can give, like, yeah, um, and I think that's there's a muscle called the brachioradialis that kind of connects the uh, the upper arm and the lower arm bones. 
um, that's kind of responsible yeah, it's for that. Yeah, just not, it looks, it looks, I mean, it's called, I mean, I guess there's, you know, they have a radius, but they don't actually have an ulna. They have a, a, la, a, a lacron. There we go. That is what they yeah. refer to as the ulna. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's crazy when you just, I mean, it, when you look at human anatomy versus like dog anatomy or, you know, just relationships between any, any animals and human beings, it's like when you really look at it, you can just see how, all this stuff just kind of slid around or lengthened or kind of merged. It's all so similar. It's wild. But yeah, clavicle. That 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 was that's awesome, man. I had never heard that before. Have you seen that video? Uh, there's like a German shepherd who was born with like a fused neck. He looks like a, they call him. Yes. Like a, yeah. It's kind of looks like yeah. the, like a weak version of this thing. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it had a, I'm, yeah, it had a, sh a shortened spine too because it's like its rear legs were like right up against its front. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking about how this creature would move, and you know that that came to mind. Yeah, fair enough. Well, it's, it's yeah, fair enough. It's amazing. I how, mean, th uh, this this would clearly be more like uh, more intentional, but just the you know the big front heaviness of it. Sure. Pretty cool. Yep, beefy. It was definitely beefy which is always fun to make anyway. And so, yeah, at this point, I'm just kind of going through and starting to build out these these spine plates. I was kind of, I wanted to kind of mix between, um, you know, kind of like a, well, like a, a leathery um, skin that's kind of modeled and, uh, and plates was kind of what I was thinking. And so I kind of wanted to go ahead and define the actual um, spine plates, kind of get an idea of how, I, whether or not I was happy with that or not. And so that's what I'm doing at that point. And uh, as I take this further, I'm hoping I can go in and, and really start doing some detailing. It would be very promising if uh, I can go in there and get some like fine skin details as far as like little points and stuff. All right, so let me go ahead and switch back on over to Canova. There we go. Excuse me, should have had that already on over. Uh, but this is where uh, it's at after another three hours after where you saw it just ended there. And, uh, you know, for, for this point, I'm pretty happy with it. His glutes need to be way stronger. Yes, Ed, I need to spend more time on the rear legs. <laughs> I've worked on the rear legs this morning. Um, but, yeah, this is something that, uh, yeah, I think this is going to, you know, develop into something I'm pretty happy with and maybe want to use. It would be pretty cool to, you know, maybe in one of these videos hop into Moto and use some of the Topo tools because this would be a super easy model to Topo. I probably could do it pretty pretty fast. And uh, actually start, you know, looking at Canova as something that is playing a role in creating final assets, you know, because that is our goal. And I think we're making a lot of great headway in that direction. Yeah, he looks awesome. This is oh, a very, very cool result. What's his name? We got to name him yeah, before this is over. Him. Help us out, chat. Help us out. Yeah, what do you guys? Okay, you guys name him. Come on, son. You're still <laughs> watching. <laughs> All right, we'll wait. It's going to take a few okay. seconds for people to actually hear that. What should he be named? Uh, FX node says build a skeleton in the sculpted in moto. Uh, this was, this was all sculpted in Canova. Greg, Greg did all of this up to this point in, uh, yeah, right in yeah, from, from scratch in Canova. And so, yeah, I might retopo him in moto. You know, that's what I was saying. And, you know, refinement, who knows, it, it would definitely need some sculpt refinement, which actually uh, surprisingly I, I can do that in moto. Um, but, uh, yeah. So what's his name? Uh, one of our coworkers here in the Austin office has a dog named Frank, Frank is built kind of like this, actually. <laughs> He's awesome when he when we go down to like Barton Springs when he brings his dogs. Everybody brings their dogs. But like Frank can't actually swim, like, but he insists on it, and so it's like this poor beefy little bulldog of an animal, like basically sinking his way from one side of the river to the other. <laughs> you know, it's hilarious. But Frank That's would funny. be a good a good name for him. But hey, if you guys in the chat have a suggestion for name, love to hear it. It's Frank until next week. If you guys can come up with something by next week that beats Frank, uh, otherwise it's Frank. There you go. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, let us know what you think about this. This is a different format for us uh, instead of mixed reality doing it this way. I think it's uh, a better way of communicating the application. Uh, the mixed reality stuff in itself is cool because it does let you see from the perspective of a person in VR what they're actually seeing, and I really like that idea. Um, but I don't necessarily think it's actually advantageous to showing you guys what the application can do and uh, and you know kind of workflow techniques. I think this is probably more practical. Uh, but we want to hear more about that from you guys, and we'll be continuing 
the sculpt next week and you'll see it go from the point we ended at um, and reaching this point which is kind of like mid-level detailing and uh, it's actually was kind of the most fun portion of it so same time next week we will continue this and uh, you know hopefully after a couple of weeks uh, actually have a final asset to talk about and show off so thanks so much for joining us hop on steam and uh, if you want to try out these features in beta just go ahead and message me or put up a posting in our discussion forums and I'll, I'll set you up and uh, we will talk to you next week otherwise so thank you so much have a great night and thank you ed for joining us again this was great cool thanks greg take care guys later